Goodlatte, co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus, and I want to welcome all of you to uh, our continuing Internet Caucus speaker series, and we're just delighted that you would take the time this morning to come and hear from Hector Ruiz, who is the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of ADM, Advanced Micro Devices Incorporated. Uh, this is an effort to uh, continue to educate uh, members of Congress and congressional staff regarding uh, uh, Internet issues uh, in a very dynamic and high-changing, uh, rapidly changing sector of our economy. And it is always uh, very helpful to us when leaders in the industry come and share some of their thoughts on what's going on uh, in their industry and uh, what we should be paying attention to in our legislative work here in the Congress. Uh, Dr. Ruiz uh, joined AMD in uh, uh, January of 2000 as President and Chief Operating Officer and was named the Chief Executive Officer in April of 2002. He was appointed as Chairman of the Board in April 2004, and he previously served as President of Motorola's Semiconductor Product Sector. Uh, he is uh, a native of uh, Mexico. He earned his bachelor's and match master's degrees in electrical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and a doctorate in electronics from Rice University, also in Texas. Uh, he's passionate about the role of technology in education and empowering the underprivileged. At the 2004 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, he announced AMD's 50 by 15 initiative, a commitment to empower 50% of the world's population with basic internet access by the year 2015. Dr. Ruiz currently serves as the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee uh, on that committee, which provides industry-based advice and expertise to the President on issues and problems related to implementing national security and emergency preparedness communications policy. He also serves on the Eastman Kodak Company Board of Directors, the advisory board of the Tsinghua uh, School of Economics and Management, and the board of directors for the Semiconductor Industry Association. Dr. Ruiz, welcome very much to the House Committee on Agriculture, which I also chair, and we, which uh, we found a very convenient location this morning. Thank you for this kind introduction, and Congressman Goodlatte and the rest of the committees that are here. You know, the work that this committee and Internet Caucus has done has been of incredible value to being able to uh, encourage and enable uh, the, the, all of the challenges revolving around what the Internet does for not only for, for business, for all of the things it does in enabling a lot of other things around the world. It has become really, truly the single most important event in the last 20 years that enables a lot of innovation around the world as well as a lot of economic growth, because in reality, it is an economic engine. Because some of you may not be familiar with AMD, I'd like to just take a few minutes to uh, give you a little bit of a background. The industry is, uh, any segment of any industry nowadays is driven largely by technology. And it doesn't matter if you're in agriculture, <laughs> or you're in medicine, or in rocket science. Uh, the, the technology that's driving all of the uh, progress and changes in any of these segments of the industry are driven by computing technology or information technology. And at the root of any of these uh, segments is uh, computational capability. And all of those things require a microprocessor. And in today's world, uh, frankly, many 20, 30 years ago, I don't think anyone envisioned an industry that could explode as rapidly as this one has. And so the microprocessor has become the single most important ingredient in information technology. Without it, you wouldn't have computers, you wouldn't have servers, you wouldn't have the products that we have become so accustomed to seeing, cell phones, etc. And so at the root of this, uh, every one of these segments of, uh, of, the, of any industry is this microprocessor technology. And one of the things that has made a microprocessor technology so powerful and so strong is being standards. It's, being, it's based on a standard, which is uh, uh, being adopted worldwide. So anywhere in the world you go, you'll see the standard. It normally is called 
uh, an instruction set architecture based on an x86 set of instructions. That standard has uh, really, truly really dominated the computer industry by and large. Um, the stand, this product is manufactured only by two companies in the world. It's Intel and AMD. They're the only two players who have enough investment in IP, enough investment in, uh, in resources, and enough commitment to be able to exploit this technology. So in reality, the barriers to entry in the microprocessor and they're so big now that it is unlikely, at least in my lifetime, that we'll see another player come in because this, this is a very powerful uh, uh, ecosystem that has been built and supported by these two companies. Um, <clears throat> it has become a very large industry, and in that industry, uh, one of the things that therefore AMD plays is the role of being a provider of the microprocessor products that go into these systems that enable the technology that I was just talking about. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do and, and that the value that I think we have brought to the industry is that we have lowered the cost of computing significantly and therefore we were able to enable the very first sub $1,000 PC in the industry. Now, nowadays, when you go to the store and you see a lot of products for $399, $499, that may seem like a long time ago, but frankly, it wasn't that long ago. It was only a few years ago that we finally were able to, to get a sub $1,000 PC. It was a major breakthrough in the industry at that time. Um, but the computer industry and the microprocessor in particular has driven a lot of things that perhaps we may not be as familiar with. It. Uh, for example, those of you who were, went to see the Star Wars Episode Three: The Revenge of the Sith uh, may not perhaps realize that that actually was made possible by computer technology that only a few years ago was very difficult to do. And that that computer technology in that particular movie uh, was based on AMD processors. Madagascar, Sin City, uh, these are examples of movies that have been done with AMD technology. So that kind of gives you an idea of how far reaching the technology is. In addition to that, um, um, the technology that we've developed has enabled uh, people on the internet, a lot of the search engine companies have based the technology in AMD processors. So sometimes when you click on a search engine and be able to surprisingly in a fraction of a second be able to get a lot of information, there's a high probability it also went through an AMD processor. So we brought a broad range of innovations to the industry, all the way from uh, the simple uh, applications of low-cost computing to the highly very complex applications of the internet servers, etc. An example of the reach of this technology is the fact that we partner in 2003 with a very famous company called Cray Computing. Uh, those of you familiar with supercomputing, uh, supercomputing has been and has always been synonymous with Cray. And uh, we were fortunate to be able to partner with him along with the U.S. Department of Energy to create a new supercomputing cluster based on AMD technology. This supercomputing cluster was uh, codenamed or at least named uh, Red Storm. And those familiar with the technology will realize that this uh, Red Storm computer became a very powerful computer in the Department of Energy work, and I'll explain to you a little bit what that did. Um, but one of the most important things that it is, it was able to simulate uh, nuclear weapons engineering simulations, which means we're able to see in a matter of days what it used to have taken years in trying to simulate what would happen to the stockpile of nuclear weapons, which is important for us to understand. And just last month, it was announced by Cray that this supercomputing cluster based on Redstorm surpassed the one terabyte per second mark, which is the first computer to do that. And uh, again, again, it's an illustration of the broad range and capability that processors based on AMD technology can do. Los Alamos National Laboratory had also partnered with us in the creation of a computer that was going to be focused on medical, environmental, the national defense modeling. So now we have a huge broad application again related to government challenges and issues. Technology is great and, and it leads to an awful lot of enablement and innovations in the industry that are important and relevant. 
But we believe that going forward is more important than ever that technology be used to solve real problems also, and real problems that perhaps in the past may have not captured our imagination as being able to be addressed by technology. So as uh, Congressman Latt mentioned earlier, we launched an initiative that we call 50 by 15. And simply the initiative is to try to form a consortium of players around the world based on universities, educational institutions, governments, industry players, um, uh, or anyone that can uh, want to be a partner in this to see if we could accomplish the goal of by the year 2015 being, be able to have 50% of the world have fundamental connectivity to the internet. It was not our intent in the initiative that we could do it ourselves. It was always our intent that we could facilitate and enable a group of players around the world that could make this possible. Today, there is roughly a billion, more or less, give or take a little bit of people connected to the internet. So you can see that if the population of the world is six billion, we have a bit to go by the year 2015. And it's an aggressive and challenging goal, but I think one that's very doable, and that will bring about a lot of to the industry, to business, to trade, and most importantly, I believe, will actually help improve the quality of life of people around the world. Um, but to accomplish that, we had to do what we call in our company a customer-centric innovation approach to solving the problem. We had to understand, well, what is it that is needed in many of these parts of the world to be able to be uh, capable of accessing information through the Internet? And one of the issues that comes out immediately is the, the, the environment that exists around the world in a village of Brazil or Africa or India uh, is quite different than the environment that we might have in Washington, D.C., in trying to put technology in the hands of school children, for example. Uh, in some of the schools, perhaps electricity is not as available, and if it's available, it's interrupted. Uh, dust, humidity, uh, conditions are different. So we had to then start from ground zero to think, could we build a platform that could actually be affordable and allow for the creation of a product and a service that people could use. So we created a product called a personal internet communicator, which for sure we call it PIC. And uh, the idea of this was to be able to create a very solid device that we could deploy in these regions. Since we did that, we've been able to um, put a deployment of these products in India, Brazil, China, Mexico, uh, Yugoslavia, Turkey, um, the, Baham, the, 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 the Caribbean, the islands of the Caribbean. So we have now really literally many thousands of these pro pro products around the world collecting data and trying to understand is how close to the mark did we come in addressing the needs of, of this uh, emerging and evolving market. And uh, to be fair, our first attempt um, allows us to learn a lot. It wasn't a homework by any means, but we learned a lot by being able to get out there and collect data. We now believe we're in a strong position to be able to truly address the needs of these um, emerging markets and emerging regions and be able to provide the products and services and connectivity necessary for these groups to be able to, to benefit from being, having access to the Internet. Specifically, in Brazil, we have a project uh, with a comp we created, it's called Ipua Temple Public Center, which is a public internet access facility in Santo Amaro, which is in Sao Paulo City. And we've had um, over 500,000 monthly customers that come now to the center to be able to access the internet. And it has served over 60 million requests by people in this region. All of that has allowed us to collect a lot of data to be able to continue to improve our opportunity here. I would like to point out that this is not done only because it's a good thing to do. We truly believe that this is a phenomenal business opportunity for us as a company that can help us bring value to our shareholders while doing something good at the same time. So we are very excited as a company. There are 9,000 AMD employees who really truly are motivated to try to make this a success because in addition to being great for our shareholders, we think it's a great thing to do uh, for the world. AMD is also a founding partner along with Google, Samsung, 
and MIT through Nicholas Necroponte in the project as we know now in the industry as a one laptop per child. Uh, this is a very aggressive program to try to develop an educational device that can be put in the hands of elementary school children that will be approximately around hundred dollars. Those of you familiar with the industry know that that's a hell of a goal to have and a very difficult one to achieve. Nevertheless, I believe that this consortium of companies, when you take giants like Samsung and Google and partner with a company like AMD that have the vision and the willingness to take risks, that I believe then it's a matter of time and it's not if but when we will actually accomplish a $100 laptop that we can put in the hands of every child. So whether you're a nuclear physicist or a child in Africa that aspires to achieve the better quality of life, we believe that the technology that AMD is involved in is one that gives the opportunity to, to impact and affect the lives of those people. That comes to which is one thing I'd like to talk about a little bit. One of the th reasons that um, we've been able to be successful in creating these products that have now found their way into low-cost computing, access into the internet access to, to emerging markets, supercomputing clusters in around the world. What has been the ability of our company, i.e. our employees, to aggressively innovate. And uh, to me, innovation is the engine of growth, the engine of, uh, of opportunity creation that is critical for all these technologies to find a relevant, applicable solutions in the marketplace. Um, we, uh, innovation is a challenge, and in this country, you know, most of you in this room better than I do, the statistics that frighten us in trying to make sure that our innovation initiatives don't get derailed as we move forward. When we look at the fact that in 2004, China graduated half a million engineers, and India graduated 200,000 engineers, while the U.S. graduated 70,000, then it is clear that there is a huge shift in momentum in technology capability that we have to be aware of and manage carefully not to lose the stronghold that I believe this country has had on innovation for a long, long time. Um, so one of the things that we have to do, of course, is to, uh, to preserve that, is to find a way to elevate the quality of our educational process in this country because it's no longer enough to be able to read and write and do arithmetic, but it's now necessary to read, write, do arithmetic, and learn the internet. And by that I mean be able to learn computers. There's a new language, there's the equalizer around the world, everybody uses the internet, the whole world is, is, is uh, leveraging the, the fact that the internet has enabled an awful lot of things to occur. And, and that's where we need to elevate our effort. And, uh, our challenge is to ensure that the initiatives in education, not only at the highest levels, which get a lot of attention, when we talk about H-1B visas and uh, the ability to attract students into graduate school, gets an awful lot of the press and a lot of the information. The reality is that the long-term solution is in K-12. through We need to make sure that our K-12 through initiatives are successful. We need to elevate them, we need to improve them, we need to get to the point where we feel confident that what we're doing in those grades are going to lead to the kind of students that then will eventually be able to leverage the higher levels of education. I believe that what has been outlined by the President in his State of the Union message makes an awful lot of sense. We as a corporation, without seeing the details behind it, know that it's the right thing to do and that we must find a way all of us collectively to support it. There's uh, increasing support for basic research. It is, um, it is um, a study recently done by Ryan Corporation seemed to indicate that we spend more money in our industries today in tort litigation than we do on basic research. Uh, we need to reverse that. Encouraging investment, improving the quality of K through 12 in education, promoting, promoting ongoing workforce training, and enhancing our nation's public policy structures to encourage and support innovation in both the public and private sector. So I believe those things outlined by the President in the State of the Union address make a lot of sense and we must find a way to support them. But you know, at the end of the day, one of the things that's important that I'd like to leave you with is regardless of all of those efforts that we do, at the end of the day, uh, all the investment, research, and specialization in the, in the, in the world 
will not amount to a growing dynamic economy unless we have a competitive environment that this country has been known for to encourage and nurture for a long time. We cannot have competitiveness without competition. And as we have learned over the last decade, <clears throat> vibrant competition is healthy. It allows consumers to have choices. It allows competitors <clears throat> that are good to survive and those that are not good not to survive. Being able to make that choice is critical for the health of the economy and is critical for the benefit of consumers. Google wasn't always the leading search engine. As a matter of fact, Alta Vista and Nas Jeeves got there first a long time ago. But Google developed better technology and was able to deliver a value to customer that was significantly better and improved. And as a result, we have now a much more successful enterprise than we would have had without competition. You know, it was the, tri the triumph of the internet, really, is a triumph of fair and open competition. And that's what allows real innovation to take place and enter the marketplace in a relevant fashion. The same is with the telecommunication. It's competitions between phone, cable, satellite, and internet providers that is gonna drive the best solution, the best value, the best services for home users and consumers around the world. <clears throat> competition benefits everybody. The opposite is harmful. <clears throat> and a good example of that is a recent example that occurred in the introduction of a 10-way calling feature by Skype, Skype, free over IP provided that was only enough, only accessible to those with an Intel dual core processor. People with computers that have bought an AMD based machine would not have access to this feature and this capability. We believe that those are artificial barriers that are inserted into software and hardware ecosystems to prevent competition. We don't think that's healthy, and we don't think that's good for consumers or the industry in general. One of the things that we have an opportunity in government, people ask me, well, what's the role of government in fair and open competition, is that it can start in government. It can start right here in Washington, D.C. Uh, for example, <clears throat> in the procurement or, uh, area. Um, you know, we recently commissioned a study done by California Institute of Technology, a reputably well-known organization, that said that in the Department of Defense alone, if we had had a fair and open procurement standards that did not specify brands or particular names, then the government could have saved hundreds of millions of dollars on that segment of the procurement alone. This only had to do with the Air Force. Imagine if we were to expand that to all branches of the government, I believe that the service could modestly be in the billions. Um, we are proud to take a vocal role in leading and encouraging fair and open competition. I believe it is a crucial keystone for the excitement and benefits that innovation can bring to our country, to consumers around the world. And as technology leaders, we recognize that for this economic engine to successfully deliver what we all know it's capable of deliver, that we have to rely on fair and open competition for this to occur. Um, this is a great nation full of opportunity. We must ensure that that opportunity continues. And I can speak from experience as, as an example of someone who personally has benefited from the things this great country has to offer. See, I grew up in a very small village in Mexico, and I was lucky enough that my village was located across a town in Texas who was enlightened and had a mayor and a principal of a school who allowed me to go to school every day, even though I lived in Mexico. So I crossed the border every morning, went to school, and went back home at night due to this enlightened group of leaders in the small Texas town. America beckoned to me as a line of opportunity. The education that I acquired at that time became key for me to develop the, the, the desire and the spirit and the encouragement to, to really follow my dream of wanting to accomplish something in the area of technology. 
Unfortunately, that is not the case for all of our children. I was fortunate enough and I recognized that a set of circumstances made that possible for me that doesn't occur often to many children. Today, it would be difficult to frankly open the doors of every border town school to all the children from every country that would want to come. But we can short circuit that through technology. I believe that technology can allow us and give us the opportunity to provide these children around, around the world with the access to knowledge and information that would then inspire them to follow their dream. I've always said in talks I give is that I am convinced that somewhere in Africa, Mexico, Brazil, India, that somewhere, or maybe in East LA, there is a future Bill Gates waiting to be discovered. But if we don't provide the access to them on techno through technology of information, uh, then it won't happen. And I think we have an opportunity to really allow that to occur, and in including that, not only bettering the world, but providing an opportunity for uh, our K through 12 to accelerate and be able to uh, be uh, accomplish its goals even faster. Technology provides us with the ability to empower. That's the one thing that I learned back when I was a kid crossing the border going to school is that empowerment is critical for these people around the world. Not only the East LA kids, but the kids in Mexico, Brazil, and India. And empowerment can come through access to technology, to access to the internet, to access to information. And the empowerment there is, uh, is profound. I'll just share a small anecdote. Uh, uh, in an effort to try to give back some of the things that have happened to me, I put in a small computing laboratory in the elementary school that I went to in Mexico. And this is a school where about half of the children go to school barefoot. And we put this little computer lab in this place with the, for the kids to have access to the internet. Now these kids have never seen a computer, had never even realized what it was. But I can tell you that within minutes, these kids could surf the net, could look for information, could learn faster, quicker than you would ever imagine they could. And when somebody asked me the other day, but are they going to be hindered by the fact that they don't speak English? <laughs> Uh, the internet is almost kind of like an international language that has no definition. These kids could surface quickly. They, they got excited. And what I can tell you today that I get emails from these kids at least once every 90 days telling them what they're doing. And they, on one hand, the thing that's very positive is they talk about their dreams. They want to be doctors, engineers, and lawyers. The negative side is that there's no path for which for them to follow. So at this point in time, they're finding a little bit of frustration is that while we've been able to open their ability to dream, we have yet been able to close that bridge that allows them to be able to pursue their dream around the world. I believe technology has the potential to impact that very significantly and help them be able to follow that dream into reality. No one can say for sure where our innovation will lead to tomorrow's technology, but what we have to do is be prepared. I think the one thing our company in being in a very competitive space has been able to do well is be prepared. I don't think I can predict we're going to be three to five years, much less 10 years from now. But if we prepare ourselves, and that applies to children in school as well as companies and corporations and government, and that we'll be able then to take advantage of the opportunities which will be funded on a fair and open competition environment so innovation can flourish and take place. With that, I thank you for your time and, and, and sincerely hope that uh, you have uh, at least got a glimpse of some of the things that I believe have made our company successful and some of the things I believe technology can do uh, for the improvement of education. Thank you. I think the protocol is to have a Q&A, is that correct? <laughs> since Congressman Vlad disappeared. <laughs> Wanted to make sure. Um, so I'd be glad to take questions that you might have on, on this or any other related subject. Yes, sir.
Sure. <clears throat> yeah. But you know, as it is in in so many things in life, uh, things like like football. You know, you got to have referees in football so that the game is fairly played, and uh, referees have to be willing to blow the whistle when a play does not follow rules and regulations that have been set. That allows for football games to be fair, and the better team uh, can win. Government has that role, and I believe there are rules and laws in the books that uh, should be enforced relative to fair and open competition. I think there are uh, rules and laws in the books relative to antitrust regulation that should be enforced. So the best role the government can play is just enforce the law to begin with. The second one is to be a beacon of an example, to be a role model. And I briefly mentioned in my remarks about procurement. I think it's critical that the procurement practices of the U.S. government be open and that, for example, when specifying particular products, they're not specified in requisitions by name, but the products are specified in requirements and the services required or the, the benefits or benchmarks, et cetera. Um, the government, you know, one of the most blatant violators of that particular procurement policy is the Department of Defense. So I think the government would do well in encouraging the Department of Defense to just follow the rules and make procurement uh, fair and open. And so with those uh, actions, I believe the government would go a long way in ensuring that a fair and open competition environment exists. Uh, we have been able to win uh, some contracts with uh, uh, branches of the, of the U.S. Department of Defense, yes. Yes, sir. Well, that's as, as, uh, similar to the procurement answer in the sense is that there are already a, a significant amount of IP regulation that should be enforced, no, first of all, no question on that. But the one thing I do acknowledge is that technology has changed so dramatically and so rapidly, and the things that, uh, that may require a, a uh, rethinking uh, um, might be appropriate. I mean, today's... Uh, Today's internet has really uh, changed dramatically, you know, instant notification of things, instant access to information, instant everything, so that there probably is a need to step back and look at some of those things, but in particularly in places where there is a large company, uh, let's take the, the drug industry as an example. We have very large corporations and some very, very small corporations that one has to be careful with what people refer to as a single company behavior, single company policies, uh, where um, you know the protection of the smaller players, the protection of a fair and open competition, even in those spaces, is very critical. And the IP regulations should be thought of in encouraging more of that instead of less. And I think there is a little bit of a dangerous move, from what I've been aware of, in Washington to consider single company behavior in such a situation where it could lead to even less competition uh, uh, in, in the, what I believe is the false belief that is in the best interest of, of the, the industry and the consumer. So I definitely think that that needs to be carefully uh, looked at. And I know that there are people in Congress paying a lot of attention to this right now. And my, encourage, my, my plea to you and all of those involved in government is, is careful with this issue of single company behavior because I really think it is important that we allow fair and open competition of the smaller players, not only in this country, but also around the world. Yes, sir. Uh, 
We don't have a company position per se because there is probably uh, more politics in that than I'm prepared to to even understand. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I, you know, we we believe it is important for you know uh, uh, some technology to be uh, uh, seriously considered as standards, and I think the issue of standards is important to never forget. I think one of the reasons. Uh, the European Union was more successful in deploying cellular technology faster than the United States is that they were able to benefit from a very strong GSM standard. Whereas in this country we had a proliferation of technologies that uh, was difficult to exploit in terms of bringing value to the consumer. And five years later after you, the European Union were now finally exploiting uh, instant messages on cell phones where it started you know, many years ago. So I think that um, um, when it comes to the area of standards, it's important to really have uh, industry participation to, with the government to do what's best uh, for the industry. But in particular, to the net neutrality, I think there's an awful lot of uh, uh, more politics than I probably am competent to comment on. And, uh, but I'll just get back to the standards issue. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's a good question. Um, 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 you know, I think that um, in the narrow view of just looking after shareholder value, I think a corporation will have the responsibility of making sure you follow innovation. And if a particular part of the world has put a focus on a particular segment of that technology that is more advanced than in our country, then you will be, a, you will have to follow that to be responsive to shareholders. And so, having said that, you know, as an American citizen and one who cares for innovation to continue to be one of the things that make this country strong and powerful, is that we need to be careful that if we allow that to occur, it is because we knowingly want it to occur, <laughs> and not because we are doing it out of neglect. Uh, as an example, I'd use uh, the manufacturing technology. <clears throat> you know, a lot of technology and innovation and manufacturing is now believed to have moved outside the United States. Um, uh, we need to decide if that's what we want or not, because we make choices every day that either make that worse or can make that better and reverse it. And I think as a as a group of voters, population, and government, we need to educate ourselves as to what are the choices we're making every day that cause that to occur. There is no, no secret that when it comes to automotive electronics, uh, German automotive electronics is leading the way. Uh, and, and, uh, and I can re you know, recite samples of many segments of manufacturing where that is occurring. But, um, you know, uh, I've I still uh, am puzzled when I open the newspapers in the morning, particularly this morning, and I open the front page, and the, the big news in the front page is that we're going to build a baseball stadium in Washington, D.C. It's not that we're going to build a manufacturing center or a factory. On the other hand, if you open a newspaper in, in uh, Berlin, Germany, more than likely that will be in the sports page. And what might be on the front cover is the fact that they have just given incentives to Samsung to build a factory in Frankfurt. And um, so I think we make choices every day. And we need to just know if those choices are truly meant to be, if we really know that that's what we want. Uh, long answer to your question, but then at the end of the day, if the innovation in a segment that's important to my industry moves somewhere else, then I will have to follow. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.